Hello, my name is Rich from Deep Groove Mono, and this is Record Collector Confessions. There's been a lot going on with collecting lately. Um, Saturday, my friends came to Manhattan to visit, and uh, one of my friends is a record collector. Yeah, we, we hit up some shops. Was totally surprised that I actually found stuff I wanted to buy. I got four 10-inch classical LPs. One is I just got for the cover art. I didn't really even care about the music. The uh, the other one I got, which was amazing, was uh, Milt Jackson's Wizard of the Vibes. Yeah, I, it's funny too. It's a total coincidence because um, I recently was getting more into the late 40s, early bebop, blue note recordings. And um, I ran into these um, Mill Jackson recordings on Wizard of the Vibe. Some of them had been released on 78. But I, but I fell in love with a couple of these uh, Mill Jackson tunes from 1951. Uh, his first recording of Bag's Groove with Lou Donaldson and um, uh, Tahiti, also Lou Donaldson and uh, their version of What's New. I never really paid that much attention to those Mill Jackson recordings and they're awesome. And then coincidentally I was in this store and I, it was just so serendipitous. Um, now condition-wise, this thing was beat up. <laughs> um, it was cheap, but it was also beat up. The cover is what I, I would call presentable. It was like split on two of the three sides. No writing on it. The back was very stained, but the labels were nice. The labels were nice. It's, it's sometimes it's like so funny that a record can get kind of trashed and the label still look beautiful. <laughs> it's also just funny how some of these records can get so wrecked. What did these people do with these records <laughs> to wreck them as much as they're wrecked? I mean, I, even if I tried to push down on the needle and drag it across the record, I don't think I could create a mark this deep as, as the marks on some of these old, old records from the 50s and the 50s especially. The irony is that it really didn't play with any groove wear. <laughs> So to think that somebody was like partying with this thing and like throwing it on half drunk or high or something and like throwing it on the floor, stepping on it, dropping stuff on it. I mean, whatever they were doing to, to wreck this thing. And then the whole time they had their cartridge aligned and, <laughs> and balanced properly. <laughs> I guess the challenge now is not selling this record. I think when I did episode one, I was basically thinking, I'm not selling anything. From now on, I'm gonna just keep everything easier said than done. Now that I'm living it, <laughs> and I'm actually doing it, and I'm trying to see how I feel about keeping records that are not really up to some insanely high standard, uh, the story is maybe a little different. And the weird thing is, is that I flashed forward to like, well, what if I start buying like every beat up jazz record I find and like, uh, I end up with like 500 more records than I currently have right now after a year or two. Where am I gonna put them? And like, am I even going to use them? Am I even going to listen to them? I wonder how much anxiety I'm gonna get if I have like, maybe a dozen or two dozen vintage jazz records in like VG minus condition, whether or not I'm gonna be okay with that, if I'm gonna be okay to, with just having them in my apartment <laughs> and not feeling the uh, impulse to sell them. The other thing with the Mill Jackson that's funny that I guess I wanted to talk about, I might have to move it out of my like pristine vintage jazz vinyl crate into like another area because <laughs> I just kind of feel like I feel bad for it but it's like kind of not worthy of that crate. <laughs> Everything else in that crate is like pretty pristine. I think the idea at first was that you know I'm really excited to like build a collection and not be so picky and just have records even if they're placeholders, you know, cause it's, you know, I'm sure there'll be times where I like to pick up the Mel Jackson record and look at the back of it and look at the label. I might even need it for research or reference, but um, I don't know if I'm gonna listen to it. 
if I want to hear that recording, I mean, I have the CD and the and I made uh, rips of the CD to my computer. I mean, the rips sound amazing. So I mean, there's really not a whole lot disputing if I'm going to listen to that or the super crackly, noisy copy of Wizard of the Vibes that I bought. Last year when I started my Keep For Now crate, which was basically just to prevent myself from buying something, listening to it once, and then turning around and reselling it right away. Uh, my idea at that time was like the Keep For Now crate, yeah, keep it for like maybe three months or something. Now I think the idea is that I want to push myself to keep it at least a year. I guess at the end of the day, I just think that I'm like a minimalist above all. Like, uh, I just don't think it's in my personal constitution to own a thousand or two thousand records. <laughs> I don't know, maybe a thousand. I don't know. All right, well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.